I'm going to be doing a quick review of ocular and optic nerve trauma. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So the evaluation of all, all orbital trauma should begin with collecting a detailed history of the injury and perfor performing a thorough eye exam. These are the most important components of an orbital injury evaluation. Imaging should be used as an adjunct, not a substitute for these two aspects of the patient exam. Pertinent details from the history include the side of injury, the acuity, and whether it was blunt or penetrating injury. The important things to look for in the documented eye exam include any visualized foreign bodies, visual acuity, intraocular pressure, presence of a relative afferent pupillary defect, fluorescein dye test results, and any visualized injuries to the anterior or posterior segments. A relative afferent pupillary defect refers to a decreased pupillary response in both eyes when a light is shined in the affected eye, compared to the robust constriction elicited in both eyes when a light is shined in the normal contralateral eye. This indicates an optic nerve lesion located between the retina and the optic chiasm. Significantly decreased visual acuity in the presence of a relative apparent pupillary defect were found to be the most significant factors that portend a poor prognosis after globe injury. Fluorescein dye is often used in the emergency setting to diagnose corneal injuries. The orange or red dye is applied onto the corneal surface and blue light is used to visualize any areas of green fluorescence, signifying a corneal epithelial defect. A site of active streaming or expanding fluorescence, referred to as a positive cytal sign, indicates a site of aqueous humor leakage, confirming a full thickness corneal laceration. When it comes to imaging, orbital radiographs only have a 64 to 78% sensitivity for fractures and are rarely performed nowadays other than for orbital metallic foreign body detection. CT of the orbits without contrast is the initial imaging modality of choice for evaluation of orbital trauma, as it is readily available, offers superior spatial resolution, and can be performed rapidly. In some instances, a non-contrast head CT may be the only orbital imaging ordered for a trauma patient, so it's important to not forget the orbits when reading trauma head CTs. If the patient has evidence of additional facial injuries, a non-contrast maxillofacial CT may be ordered. If there is concern for a vascular injury affecting the orbit, such as a chronic cavernous fistula, a CTA of the head may be performed. Ocular ultrasonography, although being heavily operator dependent, has shown to be effective in diagnosing intraocular hemorrhage, lens dislocation, and choreoretinal detachment. Ultrasound is contraindicated in the presence of a suspected open globe injury, as applied pressure may cause extrusion of ocular contents. MRI offers superior soft tissue contrast resolution without the use of ionizing radiation. However, it is more time consuming, less readily available in the emergency setting, and is contraindicated in the presence of a ferromagnetic orbital form body. While MRI is not ideal for the primary evaluation of orbital trauma, it is invaluable as a secondary modality for further characterization of orbital soft tissue injuries, including optic nerve trauma and evaluation for non-metallic form bodies, especially organic matter such as wood. The globe is situated within the anterior orbit and consists of three distinct layers, which, aside from the cornea, are indistinguishable on CT and appear as a single layer. The outermost layer consists of the cornea anteriorly and the sclera covering the remaining outer aspect of the globe. The uvea serves as the intermediate layer and consists of the iris, ciliary body, and choroid. The innermost sensory layer, the retina, is tightly attached to the ciliary body anteriorly as the sor at the sor aura serrata. The lens separates the inner globe into an anterior segment consisting of an anterior and posterior chamber filled with aqueous humor and a posterior segment containing vitreous humor. The posterior chamber is a tiny space located between the iris anteriorly and the suspensory ligament of the lens posteriorly and is indiscernible on imaging. This is important to remember as the posterior segment is often erroneously referred to as the posterior chamber during interpretation of orbital imaging. The optic nerve has four segments. The anterior portions of the optic nerve are well visualized on CT. The posterior portions, however, are better visualized on MRI. The intraocular segment is referred to as the optic disc or optic nerve head and represents the tiny segment of nerve that emerges from the scleral opening in the posterior globe. The intraorbital segment represents the remaining portion of the optic nerve within the orbit before entering the optic canal at the orbital apex. The intracanalicular segment is a short segment of nerve that passes through the optic canal alongside the ophthalmic artery. The cisternal segment represents the intracranial portion of the nerve that lies within the supracellar cistern. An open globe injury is defined as a full thickness disruption of the sclera or cornea of the eye. Prompt diagnosis and treatment are essential for optimal restoration of vision. Evaluation of these injuries should always begin with an ocular exam, as the diagnosis can often be made solely based on clinical findings. Clinical signs of an open globe injury include diffuse subconjunctival hemorrhage, an abnormally shallow or deep anterior chamber, hyphema, pupillary or iris defects, or low intraocular pressure. If there are obvious signs of globe rupture on clinical exam, measurement of intraocular pressure is contraindicated. CT findings suggestive of an open globe injury include globe contour deformity with collapse of the normal spherical shape or the flat tire sign, gross asymmetry in globe size, intraocular error, extrusion of the lens outside of the globe, an acute intraocular foreign body, which can be confirmed with the provided injury history and in comparison with prior imaging, and asymmetry in anterior chamber size, either too shallow or too deep, in comparison with the contralateral normal globe. 
Although CT is a useful adjunct in the evaluation of open globe injuries with a report sensitivity ranging from 51 to 77% and specificity of 98%, it is not reliable in isolation to exclude these injuries. So in the setting of high clinical suspicion of an open globe injury, a formal intraoperative surgical evaluation is warranted regardless of findings on cross-sectional imaging. Here we have a patient with a right-sided open globe injury with a grossly deformed and trunken globe, extensive vitreous hemorrhage, retrobulbar hematoma, and right orbital fractures. These next images demonstrate bilateral open globe injuries in a patient secondary to a blast injury. There's intraocular air and vitreous hemorrhage on the right, and the left globe demonstrates vitreous hemorrhage in a dislocated lens that has fallen to the dependent posterior segment. Trauma to the anterior segment represents the most frequently encountered ophthalmic complaint in the emergency department. Traumatic hyphema refers to anterior chamber hemorrhage and is easily recognized on clinical examination. While it does not warrant a radiological diagnosis, it does limit clinical examination of the posterior segment, which often leads to a request for cross-sectional cross imaging. Hyphema is recognized on CT as hyperdense fluid layering anterior to the lens, sometimes appearing as if there are two lenses. Corneal abrasions represent superficial corneal epithelial defects and have to be diagnosed clinically using a fluorescein fluorescein test as they are occult on imaging. Corneal lacerations represent deep and possibly full thickness corneal defects. They are often accompanied by hyphema and are diagnosed clinically via the fluorescein test. A full thickness corneal laceration constitutes an anterior clobe rupture and may be suggested on imaging when there is asymmetric decrease anterior segment volume, typically a discrepancy greater than one millimeter in the affected eye. Here we have a patient with a history of penetrating injury to the right orbit. On the top image, we see multiple right preceptal metallic form bodies. On the bottom two images, the solid arrow indicates hyphema or anterior chamber hemorrhage. The dashed arrow indicates vitreous hemorrhage. And the curved arrow is pointing out mild deformation of the globe contour, suggesting an open globe injury. Trauma-related deformation of the globe may cause partial or complete tearing of the zonal attachments of the lens, resulting in lens subluxation or dislocation. Disruption of a single attachment is termed subluxation, and disruption of both attachments is termed dislocation or overluxation. A dislocated lens typically lies dependently within the vitreous humor of the posterior segment. The diagnosis of lens displacement is made via clinical exam. However, CT can readily confirm this diagnosis as well as evaluate for additional ocular injuries. It should be noted that lens subluxation and dislocation may be spontaneous, as seen in systemic conditions such as Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and homocystinuria. In the presence of bilateral lens dislocation without a history of traumatic orbital injury, a systemic etiology should be suspected. The top image here demonstrates a left lens subluxation. The bottom image demonstrates a left lens dislocation. Blunt and penetrating injuries to the globe may result in a traumatic cataract, which manifests on clinical exam as lens opacification. In the acute setting, the natural crystalline lens becomes edematous, producing regions of decreased attenuation within the normally hyperattenuating lens on CT. In the chronic setting, calcifications may be seen within the traumatized lens. Here we have a patient with an acute traumatic cataract of the left lens with heterogeneous hypotenuation and slight loss in anterior chamber volume. Ocular trauma may cause serious fluid or blood to collect between the layers of the globe, leading to detachment of the retina or choroid from the remaining layers. Chorioretinal detachment may result from trauma, surgery, inflammation, use of medications that lower intraocular pressure, neoplasm, or rarely may occur spontaneously. Traumatic choroidal detachment occurs when fluid accumulates between the sclera and the choroid. Choroidal detachment is shown in the top image in this patient with the serous choroidal detachment typically assumes a biconvex or lentiform configuration along the medial and lateral walls of the globe, diverging posteriorly and creating an hourglass shape within the center of the globe on axial imaging. Retinal detachment allows fluid to accumulate between the retina and the choroid, as seen in the bottom image in this patient with the hemorrhagic retinal detachment. The detachment converges at the optic disc, creating the typical V-shaped configuration of retinal detachments on axial imaging, with the apex of the V located within the posterior globe at the optic nerve insertion. Traumatic orbital injury may result in shearing of retinal blood vessels with subsequent hemorrhage into the vitreous humor. On CT, vitreous hemorrhage manifests as relatively ill-defined heterogeneous hyperattenuation within the normally hypoattenuating posterior segment of the globe or layering hyperdense fluid in the posterior segment as seen here. Tursan syndrome was originally described as vitreous hemorrhage occurring in patients with intracranial subarachnoid hemorrhage as seen in this image. But now it is applied to the presence of any intraocular hemorrhage in the setting of intracranial hemorrhage. The likely etiology is increased intracranial pressure. Penetrating orbital injury from a foreign body accounts for approximately 30% of ophthalmic complaints in the emergency department. Long-term complications include endophthalmitis, which is an infection of the internal components of the globe, and vision loss. Injury details acquired from the patient's history and pertinent information from the eye exam, including any visualized foreign bodies and results of a fluorescein test, will greatly assist in the accurate interpretation of penetrating orbital trauma imaging. Orbital CT is sensitive enough to recognize metallic form bodies as small as one millimeter. 
the majority of glass form bodies are hyperattenuating and are detectable on CT unless they are very small. The low attenuation of plastic and wood may preclude detection on CT unless the foreign bodies are of significant size. Specifically, wooden foreign bodies in the acute setting may demonstrate attenuation of negative 100 to negative 200 Haskell units and can be mistaken for intraorbital air. Sonographic findings include a hyperchoic foreign body with variable posterior acoustic shadowing according to its composition. However, one should be cautious in the setting of possible open globe injury as applied probe pressure may cause extrusion of intraocular contents. MRI is contraindicated if there is suspicion of a ferromagnetic metallic orbital form body, as there is risk that movement or heating of the form body will cause additional injury. If the form body is confirmed to be non-metallic, non contrast MRI of the orbits can assist in detecting wooden and plastic form bodies, which may be missed on CT. Form bodies will typically demonstrate hypo-intense signal on both T1 and T2 sequences. The imaging report should include the specific location of the form body within the orbit, the number of foreign bodies, the composition of the foreign body, and any associated ocular or extraocular orbital injuries. An intraocular foreign body implies an open globe injury and warrants operative wound closure. Description of the location of intraocular foreign body either within the anterior or posterior segment is important, as this will dictate the surgical approach. Identifying the composition of the foreign body is also useful, as this will impact the surgeon's decision on, decision on removal. An inert intraocular foreign body, such as metal or glass, may be removed or left in place after wound closure based on its location within the globe and the patient's symptoms. Surgical removal is typically attempted for all organic orbital wooden form bodies or orbital form bodies such as wood as they carry a higher risk of endophthalmitis and orbital cellulitis. It is also important to report any injury to the natural lens such as an acute traumatic cataract as this may warrant lens removal at the time of form body extraction. The top image demonstrates multiple hypertenuating right preceptal form bodies corresponding to glass fragments. The middle image demonstrates an intraocular metallic form body. The bottom image demonstrates a hypotenuating linear form body in the right orbit with an open globe injury and right orbital fractures. Globe subluxation is rare and luxation is exceedingly rare. Globe subluxation is the anterior displacement of the mid portion of the globe beyond the eyelid aperture. Globe luxation is dis dislocation of the entire globe outside of the orbit with or without avulsion of the extraocular muscle and optic nerve attachments. Globe subluxation may be seen after orbital manipulation, typically during contact lens replacement or after traumatic orbital injury. Most reported cases of globe luxation are secondary orbital trauma. Traumatic globe subluxation and luxation typically result from orbital fractures with large retrobulbar hematoma. However, these injuries may also occur when foreign bodies become wedged into the orbit behind the globe, displacing the anteriorly. Globe subluxation and luxation are readily apparent on clinical exam, but imaging may be used to assess the integrity of optic nerve and extraocular muscle attachments, as well as evaluate for additional orbital traumatic injuries. These images demonstrate a patient with right globe luxation and disruption of optic nerve and extraocular muscle attachments. Traumatic optic neuropathy is a clinical diagnosis made in orbital trauma patients who present with decreased visual acuity and a relative afferent pupillary defect who, have, who often have no detectable intraocular abnormality on slit lamp or fundoscopic exam. The etiology may be classified as indirect or less commonly direct. Direct traumatic optic neuropathy is secondary to optic nerve injury from penetrating trauma, impingement from a displaced bone fragment, or compression by hematoma, including optic nerve sheath hematoma. Indirect traumatic optic neuropathy is thought to result from transmission of blunt force from a remote site of impact to the optic nerve without extrinsic nerve compression. Indirect traumatic optic neuropathy most commonly affects the posterior portion of the optic nerve, specifically the intracanalicular segment. When provided with a clinical history consistent with tra traumatic optic neuropathy, special attention should be paid to the orbital and intracranulocular segments of the optic nerve. Check for retrobulbar hematoma or bone fragments displacing or compressing the orbital segment. The optic canal should be carefully evaluated for fractures as associated intracranulocular hematoma may quickly lead to optic nerve compression within the small caliber canal. MRI findings of traumatic optic neuropathy include hyperintense T2 or STIR signal and diffusion restriction within the affected optic nerve segment, although these findings must be correlated with clinical history as they are nonspecific and may be seen in the setting of non-traumatic optic neuritis. Here we have three images from a patient with a penetrating injury traversing the mid-portion of the left orbit with transection of the optic nerve and medial as well as lateral rectus muscles. Next, we have a patient with skull-based fractures involving bilateral optic canals. Here we have the top image demonstrating optic sheath hematoma on the left, and on the bottom image, we see abnormal hyperintense signal within the right optic nerve in this patient with optic neuropathy. Various findings encountered during the interpretation of orbital imaging may mimic acute traumatic ocular injury. Incidental ocular calcifications, such as senescent scleral calcifications occurring at the medial and lateral rectus muscle insertions, as seen in the top image here, and drusen occurring at the optic nerve head, which is shown in the middle image, should not be mistaken for intraocular form bodies. Dysis bulbi, as shown in the bottom image, refers to an atrophic, scarred, and non-functioning globe, resulting from a remote insult, including trauma, infection, inflammation, or radiation. 
On CT, the deformed globe will appear diminutive and often contains dystrophic calcifications. Tamponade agents used to treat core retinal detachment may confound interpretation of traumatic orbital imaging. Obtaining a pertinent ophthalmic history is essential to ascertain whether the patient has received treatment for detachment. Pneumatic retinopaxy, as seen in the top left image, refers to therapeutic injection of intraocular air or an expansile gas and may be misinterpreted as an open globe injury. Therapeutic intraocular air will typically resorb in three to five days and intraocular gas will resorb in two to eight weeks. Therapeutic intraocular silicone injection, as seen in the top right image, may be misinterpreted as vitreous hemorrhage. Intraocular silicone will appear as a well-marginated hyperdense mass on CT and may be removed later or left in place at the discretion of the treating physician. Silicone scleral buckle devices, also shown in the top right image, may be used for treatment of retinal detachment and appear as hyperattenuating foci encircling the globe, encircling the globe completely or segmentally on CT. Another postoperative device, which may mimic a post-traumatic ocular foreign body, is the express glaucoma filtration device, as seen in the bottom image. It will appear on CT as a punctate metallic density within the superior medial or lateral aspect of the globe at the corneoscleral junction. Of note, the express device appears to be safe at 1.5 and 3T MRI. Choroidal melanoma and choroidal metastasis both manifest as well-marginated intraocular, intraocular soft tissue masses and may mimic the appearance of a traumatic choroidal detachment with associated hemorrhagic or probinaceous effusion. These ocular masses are often accompanied by coexisting retinal detachments, which complicates matters. MRI may help detect an underlying ocular neoplasm via the presence of soft tissue enhancement on the post-contrast sequence. So take home points are, there is no substitute for a detailed history and thorough eye exam. Any patients with high clinical suspicion of an open globe injury should undergo intraoperative surgical evaluation regardless of CT findings, and make sure to check the orbits in all head CTs. Thank you.